Good morning, good day, morning, morning, good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. And we are pleased today to have the webinar series, the beginning of the webinar series, Credit Unions and COVID-19, the response of a movement. And this webinar is really a series of presentations which will cover the cooperative credit union movement's response to the pandemic COVID-19, particularly within the Caribbean region and within the specific territories. Now, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, the regional institution of teaching, learning, and research for the cooperative credit union and the labor movement is really pleased to engage stakeholders from these different movements, particularly the credit union movements, to begin discussions on the various open mechanisms and economic, social, and other interventions which credit unions have made and can make during this global pandemic, COVID-19, to continue to impact the lives of its collective memberships. Today, we have a, a very esteemed panel. We are joined by Mr. Winston Fletcher, the president of the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions, Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry, who is the, the director of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. We have Mr. Halley Haynes, who is the president of the Barbados Cooperative Credit Union League. We have Mr. Lambert Johnson, who's the first vice president of the Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League. And we have Mr. Joseph Remy, who is the president of the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago. So today's format is very simple. Each presentation will come from every presenter in 10 minute blocks. That's all right, okay. In 10 minute That's blocks. All right, and in the 10 minute blocks, what we will be doing would be to take the presentations and then at the end, we will allow just a couple minutes to transition from one presenter to the next. On a point of housekeeping, you may post your comments in the chat box to the right of your screen. So in so doing, you will be able to come and bring your questions, your comments on any particular question asked. Now, this is a very topical issue, so I know we will re be receiving a lot of comments. After all presentations are made, we will then open up the forum and address questions which have been asked, comments which have been made. In making your comments or posing the questions, I ask for a couple things from our participants. One, that you identify which presenter your question is being directed to. And then secondly, I ask you to identify the country and if possible, the organization which you represent. So we would be able to see and, and experience the different responses of the cooperative credit union movements in the various territories. So first of all, I have Mr. Winston Fletcher, who will be delivering his presentation as the president of the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions. And his presentation is on the socioeconomic response of the regional movements. And now Mr. Fletcher, is also the president of the Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League and the chairman of the Credit Union Fund Management Company Limited, which is a subsidiary of the Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League. So I would like to invite Winston to just come to the fore and deliver his presentation on in terms of the socioeconomic responses of the regional movement. Winston? Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
and a good good morning my distinguished panelists members of the listening audience participating audience it is indeed my pleasure to be sharing with you this morning uh, on a very topical issue. I think the timing is right. And we'd like to offer my own commendations to the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies for this initiative and look forward to the mornings into the afternoon's proceedings. I'd like to acknowledge my co presenters, starting with the executive director of the college, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, my colleagues, Triple CEO Vice President Remy, immediate past president Ali Haynes, and Director Lambert Johnson from Jamaica, my first vice president. Participants, all a very pleasant morning or afternoon to you. I will quickly try to walk you through what Triple C youth socioeconomic response has been to this COVID situation. So I quickly acquaint you with Triple C U for those of you who might be listening and participating that uh, are not very familiar with Triple C U, but we sit at the center of the regional movement comprising of 17 affiliates of the English-speaking Caribbean. There are 212 credit unions with a membership of 2.4 million. And you should know that the Caribbean is really a very um, highly penetrative credit union society. The average penetration across the region is 65%, and that is measured as a, part, as a percentage of membership of the participating labor force. As of 2018, we have some vital statistics that we can share with you quickly. We had an assets base of 6.2 billion, as you can see in US dollars, which is equivalent to around 19% of our regional gross domestic products. A savings portfolio of 5.2 and a loan book of 4.2 billion. So I would like to think that we are an impactful organization. We, we, we are of some note within the Caribbean region, and I'm happy to be sharing with a wider audience. So, topic of the moment, COVID. What do we know about COVID? Well, as they would say, China sneezed as we have it, and the world has caught a virus that has kept the rest of us up at night, scratching our heads, trying to find a solution. Not only the scientists, but even we in credit union land trying to really cope with what this suffering has brought to our shores. Since it's, it has emerged on the scene, it has transmuted in terms of social and economic shocks and dislocations right across the globe. A shock that its magnitude and the speed at which it is moving is really of significant, like great proportion, causing disruption to our social and economic life. And so the global supply chain of matter of global commerce is not the same anymore. Maybe we'll never be the same anymore. We have had a loss in production, almost production in many cases have come to a standstill. That is trending most economies, if not all, into a global recession. And some persons are projecting, forecasting that we'll actually have a depression. The end result of this, we believe, is going to be significant decline in global gross domestic products. And that, of course, will have implication for all of us. So what has been our response, Triple CU's response? Well, as you know, credit unions are integral to the global financial landscape. In fact, we like to position the view that the, the credit unions are really vehicles for social and economic transformation. And we do that through the financial inclusiveness that we provide. We provide people with access to financial products and services, those who are considered 
underserved, underbanked, unbanked, and so forth. So we are taking care of the small man. But as an apex body, <clears throat> we have some key roles that we play. We are chief advocate, chief arbiter, negotiator, facilitator at different times. So in our advocacy role, we've been talking with our regulators, for example. Credit unions are faced with challenges at this time, more so in the areas of liquidity and so forth. And so we are in saying to, to our regulators, can we relax momentarily, temporarily, some of the prudential and regulatory standards and not penalize if standards are breached because of this really mammoth task that we mammoth task that we have confronting us. So for example, our audited financials are due at the end of March. If they have not made it, can we have some discretion there? IFRS 9 standards, should they be breached? Can we have some discretion? The matter of liquidity support, how can we relax some of the prudential standards to give some liquidity support to our members? Loans, moratorium, postponement of AGMs and so forth. Now I can tell you that as a regional movement, triple CU that is, we have also set up a foundation that comes to the fore in times of need. In normal times, we serve our members in less constricting manners. But in times like these, we are on the forefront mitigating and ameliorating where as much as we can by way of the corporate social responsibility <coughs> role that we play. We like to think that the social and economic well-being of our affiliates and our credit unions by extension are really key success factors for the triple CU itself, as well as the welfare of others, the broader society, lends itself to so the sustainability of ourselves as a movement, as well as a society in general. Most governments of the region would have signed off to some <coughs> Millennium Developmental Goals and some Sustainable Development Goals by the UN. And all of what we're trying to do in normal times, and even times like these, is to really subscribe to the accomplishment of those goals. In a very specific way, though, as it relates to COVID, we have engaged in social dialogue with some of our social partners, the PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, SIDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Authority, and of course our affiliates. As to how could we assist in time of need? And so we have been able to come up with a, with a donation to the three, two entities of 115,000 US dollars. And this is to really assist in the procurement and the distribution of protective, personal protective equipment to assist with the, some of our frontline staff and then the credit unions, the medics, the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, and other frontline personnel that are fighting this, this virus, as well as the coordination and the distribution of logistics associated with how we move these um, supplies across the region, hopefully in a seamless way, which will be spearheaded by SEDEMA. And so we've been happy that we could really make this small contribution. We trust that it will go a long way in helping those in the fight COVID to reassure them they are not alone, but also to help to fortify them in some way in the work that they're doing. And so what are the goals that we try to accomplish by we participate. It's simple, it's really an alignment of our corporate social responsibility functions with our core values. Credit union is really about people, people helping people. Your brother's people. And so leadership demands that you protect the team from externality. In times of crisis, like now, we want to protect, and that's what we're doing by virtue of that donation. It's all living the credit union philosophy, people helping people. So this is a natural response from Triple CU. We hope that that 115,000 that we have provided, as well as the other 
initiatives that we have undertaken will help to fortify, to enable, and to empower our frontliners, as well as our members. We hope that it will make a positive difference in the lives of our members and the broader society. If it impacts on society in a very positive way, that will help us in the achievement of our overall corporate goals of sustainable development at the level of the society, at the social, economic, and the environmental. These are our broad expectations. And once again, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank the college for really undertaking this initiative for us to share our perspective. Until such time for questions and comments, I hand back to moderator Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, for that very insightful presentation, um, particularly as we prepare for Dr. Henry, you know, to, to go into the presentation, looking at, you know, the, the social protection and credit unions really being utilized as instruments of, of social protection. And what was particularly instructive is the reach we're looking at through the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions, particularly adhering to our goals, to our principles, to the foundation of the movement. So very happy to hear that. Um, well, we have over 250 registered participants in today's webinar, which is really a representation of the need for this discussion in the movement. You know, apart from Trinidad and Tobago, we have Barbados, Guyana, Anguilla, Antigua, and Barbuda, St. Kitts, Nevis. And, you know, it's really heartening to, to be joined by all these persons. So next up, we have Dr. Andre Vincent Henry, who is the director of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, who under his directorship this webinar series is really being presented and we're really pleased to do it in partnership with the cooperative credit union league of trinidad and tobago and the caribbean confederation of credit unions so dr henry the floor is all yours sir. uh thank you colin and on behalf of the college i just want to welcome everyone um i want to congratulate Colin and his, his comrade in arms, the deputy director of the college, uh, Mr. Sheldon Salino, for putting this together. And just to say how pleased I am that we've been able to attract such a distinguished panel of presenters. Um, I am in no way an expert on, on cooperatives, and I rely on Colin and Sheldon to, to guide me in this regard. But as a citizen of the Caribbean, I have a, a, deep, a deep passion for social protection. And so the focus of my presentation will be uh, just throwing out some ideas on how we could view credit unions as instruments of social protection. Um, I'm quite impressed by the presentation by the president of the CCCU um, because he's really touched on the core of social protection, which is the, the cranial movement, which is the issue of the extension of corporate social responsibility. But just to say, what is social protection? And social protection, or some may call it social security, needs to be seen as a right um, and is just a set of policies and programs that are designed to reduce and prevent poverty and vulnerability throughout the life cycle of, um, of individuals. And in this regard, it includes social protection, uh, income security for the unemployed, in some security for the elderly, uh, pensions, in some income security for people with disability, income security for children, income security for pregnant women, access to affordable health care, access to affordable education, at least to the primary level, access to affordable housing, and access to sanitation. 
what social protection seeks to do is to tackle the challenges of poverty, vulnerability, and social exclusion. And that is why um, there's always this nexus between the credit union movement and the, and the, the labor movement. In the words of uh, the, the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, I see these as uh, comprising what Dr. used to uh, people sector. So credit union uh, social protection could be seen as both an approach as well as a system. As an approach, social protection is to reduce the risk faced by the vulnerable. Uh, because in all likelihood, persons who are already vulnerable do not have the resources to face uh, an unforeseen And so what we do in social protection is to reduce the risk, especially by the vulnerable in a society. And this could include interventions by the public sector, the private sector, and civil society. But there's also very important social protection as a system. And social protection as a system is the responsibility of the government. But there is still a role for actors in the way a social protection system is framed. Um, and this is especially important when a government is resource constrained, constrained, sorry. And when I say resource constraint, I am not only thinking in terms of financial resources, but constraint in terms of uh, sensitivity, in terms of capacity to think um, broadly and to take into consideration the, um, the, the condition of persons who may be voiceless or marginalized. In any, in any um, system, what we tend to find is that the more powerful tend to have the bigger voice. But you know, as I was, was listening to the president's uh, presentation a while ago, um, it, what, is, what has been reinforced in my mind is that the credit union movement, the regional credit union movement, and by extension, national credit union movements are not, are not supposed to be voiceless, and they're certainly not without, without power. Let's look quickly at the state of Caribbean working people. In a study uh, done on a percentage of population below the poverty line, out of 173 countries, this is the where countries in the Caribbean scored. Suriname is sixth with 70% of persons uh, living below the poverty line. Belize, 37th with 41%. Grenada, 42nd with 38 Guyana, 49th with 35%. Um, Dominica, uh, uh, 67th with 29%. Uh, Anguilla, 83rd with 22%. Trinidad and Tobago at 106%, and Jamaica at, um, at, sorry, Trinidad and Tobago at 20%, and Jamaica at 17%. I have some concerns about the, the, the method of, um, by which these numbers were derived. The source, as I indicated, is Index Mundi. But what it shows, and this is, a, and this is an issue for me, and I think something that that my institution needs to take on board is the failure in the region to actively and accurately measure poverty and the implications of poverty for our societies. The last set of careful, uh, robust methodological um, assessments were done more than uh, more than 12 years ago in the period 2007 2008 that that period um and there hasn't and these were studies that were funded by the caribbean development bank there hasn't been any rigorous study since then um so while the the data is dated i, I just want to point to, to some of the findings 
what we found is that a lot of workers in the Caribbean are living one paycheck away from poverty. So beside persons living below the poverty line, there are large numbers of persons who, while not yet categorized as poor, are vulnerable to poverty. And the Grenada Country Poverty Index indicated that the Grenada Country Poverty Index that was prepared in 2008 showed that 2.4% of the population was indigent or exposed to extreme poverty. 7.7% were living in poverty and 14.6% were vulnerable to poverty. Even if we look at the data that was provided by uh, the sources that we just looked at and there is a, a non-profit that did some work that brought this current to two changed markedly in the last 12 years. So what you really have is almost 50% of, of the population of a country in the Caribbean, and I believe this could be repeated in other countries, who were either in extreme poverty, living in poverty, or vulnerable to poverty. And so my question is, with the disruptions of the pandemic, what would the effect of these population groups be? Um, so as I indicated, areas of social protection, uh, uh, when we think of the credit union movement, and I am indebted to Colin and, and Sheldon for their input and guidance on this, is that we've identified five areas that we believe speak to uh, speak to a role for the um, for the credit union movement in addressing the immediate effects of, of of the pandemic and contributing to social protection. These are child and family benefits, maternity benefits, unemployment benefits, uh, disability benefits, and old age benefits, and. We believe that the role of the credit union can be divided into two, two broad categories. One is as an employer, and two is as a provider of services in its core business. And the items that we have identified, we think are a good guide and they are in alignment with the sustainable development goals. And we just quickly run through what we had as a menu of options in this regard. With regard to um, SDG number one, which is which we believe, which is no poverty, and we believe speaks to unemployment support. Um, we see the role of the credit union movement as continued access to affordable insurance and financial services to members via loans, and this is a part of, of the core business of the movement. With regard to gender equality, this is a particularly um, vulnerable time for issues related to maternity protection. Uh, we see a role of the, the role of the credit union here falling as to ensure um, both as employer, but also as, a, um, as, as part of its business is to ensure the adoption of non-discriminatory policies and practices, as well as providing products and services which can assist members to access insurance and proper health care, with the result of, in this period, um, limiting the impact on maternal and infant mortality. On the issue of decent work and economic growth, once again, the, the social protection areas, sickness benefits, and credit unions could partner with institutions to provide members with insurance and financial products which are critical in periods of interest. With regard to child and family benefits, there's an op uh, opportunity to extend membership, especially in the Caribbean, to families of members, to allow family members to participate in sustainable economic activity, and also to allow all members of the family to access the same benefits and products as 
members of the of, of, of the movement. And finally, old age benefits. As you would know, credit unions are the main financial institutions for uh, retirees. They are, these are particularly high risk, viewed as particularly high risk by other financial institutions. And credit unions should still provide financial products and services to this group. So in summary, the initiatives could include reduced payments, loan interest payments only, loan repayments and temporary fees, uh, freezes, loan extensions, greater focus on membership education and skill development, facilitation of entrepreneurial activities among members, utilization of reserves to provide support as financial and social support, and ensuring the maintenance of fair and decent work for employees during the period. But then I think we have to look no, and this ties back into the observation that I made at the start based on um, the president's presentation that showed the, the penetration, the size, the impact of the movement. And we need, I want to suggest that we need to move away from just thinking in terms of the of when we think of policy and think we, we need to move away of just thinking in terms of policy that affects the movement per se and to do a, a big new think and to construct a big new agenda um, for the credit union movement which would include um, input in important policy areas that while it may not affect directly individual credit unions and even the credit union movement itself would impact on the core, the, the, the core membership or the core group of people that the credit union addresses and some of the areas that, uh, that, that fall into this category from, from my mind is building a new entrepreneurial class of small and micro enterprises, um, focusing on areas related to food security, focusing on providing options for members because I am sure that COVID-19 is not going to be the only pandemic that would assail countries like ours and assail the work. But what we have seen is, um, business people engaging in, in serious uh, price gouging. Credit unions need to look at how we mobilize uh, community assets and very important in forming broader policies that protect the, the, the movement's members. So with these thoughts, um, as I said, I bring them more from the perspective of my interest in policy and particularly policy related to equity and fairness. But I see a, a very dynamic role for the credit union movement, not only in, um, in during the crisis, but certainly in the post-COVID new normal. Thank you, Colin, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Very thought-provoking uh, presentation there. Um, you know, you, the song did um, very, very versed in terms of, you know, the, the credit union experience and in terms of what would have been the requirements. So I think it, it really jolted, particularly in responses around the entrepreneurial engagement and even the price gouging and looking at food security and the role organizations and institutions, values-based organizations like these can bring to the table. So thanks very much, Dr. Henry. Next up, we have from the Barbados Cooperative Credit Union League, Mr. Halley Haynes, who is the president of the Barbados Cooperative Credit Union League. And, and Halley will bring his perspective and indeed his experiences and share the Barbadian experience as we, we are joined by a number of people from around the Caribbean, including Barbados, Grenada, Bahamas, 
St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica, you know, and, you know, so we really have this forum as a sharing opportunity. So, Hali, you can take it away. The floor is now yours. Good afternoon, comrades. Yes, uh, good afternoon, yeah. sir. <laughs> Let me, first of all, express sincere thanks and appreciation to the Cipriani College for holding this session. I think it is very important, especially as we, as a region, look for responses for COVID-19, but more importantly, that we have developed the strategic policy frameworks to facilitate the growth and development of the credit union sector in the region. Um, I will first look at the micro uh, financial context in relation to Barbados. The 2018 Financial Stability Report in Barbados, which is an undertaking between the Central Bank of Barbados and the Financial Service Commission, um, assessed the industry as a $25 billion industry. And the commercial bank's assets accounted for around 51% of the assets of the sector while the credit unions accounted for just under 10% of the total assets. As at December uh, 31st, we had some 32 credit unions in Barbados uh, with membership of 215,721 persons, assets about 2.6 billion Barbados dollars, deposits at 1.9 billion Barbados dollars, and loans at 1.7 billion Barbados dollars. And we have in the employed in the sector some 560 persons. Uh, I will look at the structural features of our credit union sector in Barbados. The sector development has been highly skewed in that the largest credit unions account for 55% of the total assets of the sector, and the second largest accounts for about 20%. The other ex the others 50% have assets less than $4 million. So in Barbados, there's an urgent need to the for the restructuring of the sector. Small credit unions are plagued with many challenges. Yes. Um, for example, limited product offerings to attract new members and grow the wallet share of existing members. Limited capacity to meet more, more robust regulatory standards, which are evolving limited management capacity to comply with the relevant international financial reporting standards. It is against this background that the sector needs to be restructured. And currently, the league is at the front, forefront in consultation with the membership to look at methods to see what, how we can reduce the sector to lead to a 20% reduction for the institution. Notwithstanding that, the League is currently working on a shared services initiative to assist small credit unions by providing internal audit and compliance services with a particular focus on compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing standards. It is critical, one of the critical components of the operations of credit unions is access to digital solutions. Right here in Barbados, only three of our largest credit unions have provided some type of digital solution to members. Members have access to point of sale systems and ATM network. The three credit unions have already issued 132,000 cards, debit cards, which have been issued. And the available statistics suggest that over the past year, some 74,340 um, cards or being in usage of 56 percent. The Barbados League is currently working on a project to provide debit and credit card solutions to all credit union members. It is anticipated that the first phase of this project will be completed by October 31st, 2020. As it relates to COVID-19 policy responses, the sector has been engaged in discussions regarding appropriate policy responses in the light of the severe impact 
of the pandemic and that economic activity. It is noted that Barbados is highly dependent on tourism for the generation of foreign exchange, direct employment opportunities, and ancillary services such as restaurants, transport, and attractions. This sector has been hard hit since most hotels have closed and workers have been laid off. In addition to the national shutdown, has also closed all but non-essential services. The policy responses have been focused on primarily four areas, easing the financial burden on members, observing the necessary safety and health protocols, and advocating to the regu for regulatory forbearance as a backstop support mechanism, and advocating for the inclusion of credit unions in the national payment systems. As it relates to the easing of the burdens, we have agreed on a package of um, relief measures, which includes moratorium on loan payments for three months in the first instance, with the possibility of extension for a further three months. Decisions will be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. The waiver of all penalties in respect of term deposits that are broken before the full term expire, and the waiver of all fees on their payments. In addition, the sector is now in, involved in discussions regarding how tangible support can be provided to members who are experiencing severe hardship as a result of the loss of employment and our reduced working hours. As Dr. Henry indicated, we have a social responsibility to ensure that we support our members in these most difficult times. As you are aware, credit unions were born out of difficult times. And no more than ever, we have to put our hands in the ear to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society are afforded the opportunity to live and provide livelihoods for themselves and their children. So we are in the process of looking at some form of cash or in-kind grants to those persons we have identified. At the last big morning meeting, we have established a committee to set up a criteria so that we can be in a position to respond to the members who are in need of support. Um, in, in relation to our 560, um, 100 member, 560 members, we have already ensured that we observe all the safety protocols within the credit union section in relation to social distancing, physical distancing, and all the health protocols in relation to the operationalizing of the credit union sector. Uh, we know that this is difficult times. There is no doubt that many credit unions will be impacted due to the spike in unemployment and will have significant impact on the credit union sector. And there is a likelihood that there will be spikes in non-performing loans during this period, declining profitability, reduced capital adequacy, and delays in reporting within the, from, from, uh, within the time frames established by the statute. To this end, the League has been in discussions with the Financial Service Commission to look at some possibly forbearance, regulatory forbearance uh, in relation to the holding of AGMs, uh, the capital situation, and among other things. One of the lessons from COVID-19, um, I think that came head of, head of talk, is the, the issue of deposit insurance. Let me say the Barbados League has been lobbying the government of Barbados for the last 10 years to, supply, to provide deposit insurance for our members. So all we are asking for is the same level payment fee that exists within the, finance, the banking sector, the access to the deposit insurance scheme. We will continue our efforts in lobbying the government of Barbados as it relates to providing 
a deposit insurance scheme for credit unions. For too long, credit unions have been excluded from the national payment systems. This must change. And to this end, the League is working assiduously uh, with the assistance of the Central Bank of Barbados to ensure that we have access to the ACH payment systems so therefore we can improve the delivery of services to our members. In Barbados, digital commerce is being heavily promoted as a way of the future. Further digital solutions to give customers more convenient payment options in a world that is becoming increasingly digital has to be the imperative. COVID-19 has in some way accelerated our efforts to the, to the, towards the implementation of the more, of our more digital solutions. So credit union members will therefore need to have greater access to debit and credit cards, mobile and online banking solutions. Let me say the challenges for the sector, while there are appear insurmountable, there we have been born out of difficult circumstances. I want to just before I close look at what the future will look like and what we must do. It is clear that retrenched workers will not find immediate employment post-COVID. There will be slow and gradual rebound of traditional economic drivers such as tourism. And due to challenges experienced by large enterprises, new opportunities will, engage, will emerge for a new class of startup enterprises. New startups will require novel financial services. And I think this is where it affords us in the credit union sector a space. It is understood that like other sectors, the credit union movement is one of traditional organizations that will be impacted post COVID. So we will continue to lobby government and regulators for the over, overdue changes by positioning the credit union movement to be an essential partner in economic regeneration. I think Dr. Henry alluded to that point earlier. And we will move aggressively towards digital banking and fintech services. And we will also swiftly equip the credit union movement to support the emerging startup enterprises. Because I, th I think locally, and that we have to put more emphasis on our local enterprises and to offer the type of support to build back the economic uh, structure of our economy. This is not business as usual. And I want to, to close by quoting from the father of management, Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker says, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. Comrades, I invite, at this time I invite, I will take the questions as, as, as we discuss, but I think the discussion um, around how do we respond to a regional, uh, a global pandemic, the regional and national imperatives. I thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ali. Very insightful. And I think I, I always enjoy when the discussion is going this organic. You know, you would see every presentation flowing one into the other, particularly working together as movements. Um, you alluded to the social protection and tangible ways that credit unions can now partner with other organizations and in particular and what would be interesting as we go into the discussion is how credit unions as financial cooperatives could partner with the non-financial cooperatives to to really get some some social protection interventions as far as that goes so i really thank you ali for that presentation and you know um this 
webinar series will continue every Thursday for the next four Thursdays and next week. This week we are taking the, the in terms of the macro perspective, the policy level. Next week we'll be looking at the operational level and it's good to have this partnership with the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions together with Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. And next up we have Mr. Lambert Johnson, who is the first vice president of the Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League. And he is also the president of Gateway Cooperative Credit Union. And just to get some, some policy, policy perspectives as far as the Jamaican experience goes, and you're very happy to have Mr. Lambert Johnson, an attorney at law, and looking very um, official in this in lockdown period, <laughs> Lambert. <laughs> we, we're happy to have you here to bring this presentation. So please, before it's yours, you can take it away, Lambert. <laughs> good morning, Colin, and good morning, fellow corporators. I just wish to thank the organizers. I just wish to thank the organizers of this webinar. I think it is very timely. And as I make my presentation from the salubrious environs of Savannah Lamar, deep in Western Jamaica, I must say, I must commence by starting out that this is too good a crisis to waste and it presents us all with the opportunity to deal with our business as not business as usual but business unusual and today i will speak about the the response the policy response of the jamaica cooperative credit union league and so just to give you a little background information, the president of Triple CEO, Mr. Winston Fletcher, indicated that regionally, we have one of the deepest penetration in terms of the credit union movement. Well, for Jamaica, that is very true because we have approximately 1 million members out of a population of 2.7 million. And we currently have 25 credit unions. And so you can see that with 1 million members, we are indeed a very important institution in to the country and to the economy of Jamaica. Now, so the, the philosophy that guides all the policies that have been put forward to ensure that this COVID-19 pandemic does not do us great harm is that the League on a whole wish to ensure that the credit union movements not only survive, but they continue to grow and become more robust and that their sustainability because this movement is so important. It is intertwined in the very fabric of society. And so with that in mind, it is recognized that we are just too big to fail. So currently, the league in Jamaica, um, with all the credit unions, well, not the league, the credit union movement in Jamaica has approximately $130 billion in assets and close to $100 billion in loans. So you can see from that very background that this is a very important se sector and segment, segment of the financial landscape. Now, so what are we intending to do to assist the members to ensure that they will survive, they'll continue to grow, and that they'll continue to prosper. Because 
it must be borne in mind that interest payments are the lifeblood of any interest payments on loans are the lifeblood of any credit unions. And so with the financial downturn, which has been brought about by COVID, this stream of income is clearly in jeopardy. Well, mention was made of China sneezing, but I think it's closer home. We usually say that when the USA sneezes, the Caribbean or Jamaica catches a cold, but the USA seem to be having full-blown pneumonia. And so if that is the case, it seems as if the economies of the Caribbean and in Jamaica might find, we might find ourselves in the intensive care unit for want of a better phrase at this time. But to prevent that and to ensure that we survive, these are the things that the ja Jamaica Cooperative Credit Union League is putting in place. Now, presently, the liquid assets ratio of the members is required to be 20%. But it is seen that this has to be reduced. And so there's I think um I think we get a vibration there. Yeah, Lambert, you Lambert, you you fell off for just a while. Fant yeah. No. Yes, so of course, um, as we deal with the with the COVID situation, these are what we call the um, the new occupational hazards, or what we call. Um, I heard um, Comrade Remy in an interview interview this morning talking about the new the new normal, and you know, and <laughs> what should be the new normal. So as as we transition to this new normal, <laughs> these are the challenges we usually have to face, and. Uh, you know, I, I will take this opportunity as we await Lambert to rejoin us to also inform that this will continue for the next four Thursdays. And next week, we'll be looking at the, the operational responses throughout the Caribbean region. So we have Lambert back on with us. So, yes, we are here in you loud and clear, sir. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, that was a technical glitch. Yes, so the liquid assets ratio has been reduced from 20% to 17%. So that 3% reduction is expected. That 3% reduction is, is expected to release over two, an additional $2 billion into the system. And apart from releasing that additional 3%, the league has taken the proactive step of arranging liquidity support. Yes, Lambert. Yes, I, I know you. I know you. May, you may be hearing me, but um, we are not hearing you once again. I, right? Yes.
So as we as we continue to wait on him, um, I'm seeing the, in the question column, people are asking about having the recording made available. So yes, the recording will be made available. So Lambert has joined us once again. So Lambert, I see your mic is muted. You could just unmute and come straight into your presentation. Yes, yes, I am back. Yes. Right. So we have a stabilization fund, which is proactive instead of being reactive, like the usual insurance schemes that waits until the, the institution fails. Because after the institution fails, that's when the usual deposit insurance scheme steps in. And when they step in, it might then be too late. But our stabilization fund is proactive. Um, what we do once a credit union is experiencing difficulties, they are able to come to this fund for assistance. But in this case, what we do, we are seeking to take a portion of the available money and to unlend it to credit unions if the need arises. Additionally, we are looking at credit unions that have excess liquidity to see if they can put this money in a fund so that it can be unlent to other credit unions. So this is the true cooperative spirit at work. Credit unions helping credit unions. And last and by no means least, we look for, we look to government financial financing options. So the Bank of Jamaica, they have indicated that they will, they are prepared to assist the Ministry of Finance and the Development Bank of Jamaica. Now, so in relation to the Central Bank of Jamaica, and we are in discussions with them, and this has been ongoing for over 15 years, and we are expecting that they will become our regulators. And that is why we keep very closely into our central bank so that when they become our regulators, we will already be familiar with the way they operate. No, so we have had discussions with the central bank about offering moratoriums, um, about how we, for guidance, as to how we treat with delinquency and provisioning so that we are able to give the advice to the credit unions so that they know how to manage their portfolio. We have also requested and received from our regulators, um, that would be the Registrar of Cooperative and Friendly Societies and also the Bank of Jamaica for the extension, for an extension for us to file our audited financial statements. That has been granted. Now there is a very important one that is being held with the registrar because we are now in what is called, regarded as AGM time. But for this, the registrar is prepared to give us permission for electronic annual general meetings. But to my mind, even though electronic general meetings would be far cheaper and might be more efficient the annual general meetings where persons meet, I find that those provide us with a deeper and richer experience. So if it is, we can wait, wait out this COVID-19 epidemic and have our agent, so be it. But if circumstances force us, then clearly we will have to consider having our agents at this time. Another policy that has been considered and in fact has been put forward by the Bank of Jamaica is that we look at not paying any dividends for this year. Um, there has been robust discussion around this topic because the feeling is it should not be prescriptive for all credit unions but that each credit union should assess their circumstances and decide whether or not this should be done. 
But the thought process driving this suggestion is that in this time of crisis, we need to be able to ensure that the financial foundation of the institution remains solid. Great. So, yes. Yes, sir, um, but yes. Yes. So, these are the matters that are being considered. These are the suggestions that have been made because we realize that at this time, we need as a league to be leading from the front, presenting yes. options to all members to yes. ensure that at the end, they will survive this pandemic. Not, well, not only survive, but thrive and yes. succeed and continue to grow exponentially. Yes. Um, I will now take questions if that's, <laughs> if that's, but don't trip over yourselves. I'll answer all the questions <laughs> as they come. Definitely. And you want to thank you for that presentation. And you know, um, uh, after we have Mr. Remy coming up next, you know, we will facilitate all the questions and we have had questions coming in. You know, and uh, I particularly like the reference to the intensive care units. And certainly if we don't end up in intensive care, hopefully we don't end up in the high dependency unit. <laughs> so hopefully as a movement, we can see true COVID and post-COVID. So thank you, Lambert, for that, for that presentation on the Jamaican experience. And next up, we have Mr. Joseph Remy, who is the president of the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago. And some in some quarters, they also call him comrade. As I heard Halley, you know, um, <laughs> affectionately refer to him. And Mr. Remy will take us through the, the policy responses on the part of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Joseph Remy, the floor is yours, sir. You can take it away. All right, and you could just unmute your microphone so we can we can have you successfully in the meeting. All right, and as we wait on Mr. Remy, just to let you all know that the webinar will be shared. Hi, good, afternoon. good afternoon, everyone. You hear me now, Karen? Yeah, in your loud and clear, sir. Take it away, Joe. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. Me, first of all, you know, I would really want to thank Cipriani for this opportunity. And let me say it was really something that I had the opportunity to be at Cipriani some time ago as the chairman of the Board of Governors. And I was there when they launched the online training programs, you know, and, and there were some glitches thereafter and something then happened, you know, the way it was supposed to happen. But I am really heartened now of where we are relative to this whole work that Cipriani is doing as the regional, but um, institution for the education and development of credit unionists and the trade is a unique institution because it's the only institution that provides that kind of educational development for the trade union movement and for the cooperative credit union movement. I, I don't know if you're seeing my presentation on the screen, Colin. No, I'm not seeing it as yet. Um, let me let me try again. Yeah. If not, I will have to talk you through. I hope I would not be able to do that, but one way or the other, you know. And I, yes. I want to really commend Dr. Vincent. I think that, you know, his presentation took me back to the days when he was involved in the in the Promalco initiative, you know, promotion of management and labor cooperation. And something that we had we had our issues at that time, you know, but it's something that I think is absolutely necessary at this time as mm -hmm. we try to push the whole framework. Colin, I'm having some challenges in getting my presentation up, but let me take it through, you know, in terms of what the landscape in Trinidad and Tobago is, you know, and I really want to put that into the con in context first before yes. we get into what are some of our policy perspectives. Okay. Trinidad and Tobago has 130 registered credit unions with about 71 who are very active. And the asset base in Trinidad and Tobago's credit union movement at this time is 16.6 billion TT dollars. We have an approximate membership of around 636,000 members, which equates to over just over 50% of our population. 
and there is a mix between community-based and industry-based credit unions in Trinidad and Tobago. The unique situation is in Tobago. Most of the indigenous credit unions are community-based credit unions, so they, they are the heart and soul of the society in Tobago. With respect to the overall asset base, Trinidad and Tobago, the share capital at the end of 2018 stood at $12 billion with a loan portfolio of just around $9 billion and a reserve require, um, base of $2 million, which gives us a particular space. And I think Dr. Henry spoke about the fact that the movement should have been occupying a particular space in the landscape in terms of national de development. The League as the National Umbrella Body for Credit Unions would have been deeply involved in consultations with the government over the past four years on the issue of a, of a national cooperative policy that we felt was going to be the guide for the development of cooperatives in Trinidad and Tobago. And it would have also served as the basis for the development of the new legislative and regulatory framework for the supervision of credit unions. But despite the fact that the final policy document has not been published as yet, the League recently engaged in discussions with the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, that is prior to the advent of COVID-19, COVID on the role that credit unions can play in national development. These talks are very promising, and arising out of these discussions, we had agreement on the following. One, that the government was in agreement with the League for the development of an independent cooperative authority to govern and regulate both the financial and non-financial cooperatives. We had been successful in moving away from having regulations done under the central bank because we felt that was not going to be in the best interest of the movement. We had the we have agreed to a mandatory deposit insurance. I heard Harley spoke to that issue. We talked about immediate strengthening and enhancement of the operations of the Office of the Commissioner for Cooperative Development. We know that the credit unions are now required to deal with more intricate financial issues, and as such, the regulatory competencies need to be uplifted to match those things. We also talk, talk agreed that credit unions would be allowed to process utility bills on behalf of their members. And there was an am immediate amendment to the Cooperative Societies Act to increase the amount payable to a named beneficiary on the debt of a member from $5,000 to $50,000. Now, those were some of the success stories out of those recent discussions. And we have agreed to continue discussions on some areas inclusive of removing the limit of the 50,000 entirely as exists in other jurisdictions regionally and globally. We also talk about the ease of granting mortgages to credit union members. We try to get away from having every individual mortgage application must go to the commissioner for approval. And we believe that is something that is stymieing the development of the credit union movement in terms of providing housing for their membership. We are talking also about having an allowance for joint deposit accounts to be held by particularly husband and wives in certain areas where they are both members of the same credit union. So those are the things that we are talking about. We still believe that we should remove the issue of the rigid um, requirements with respect to investment, accredited investment. We're not saying that you could just engage in any risky investment, but once they are accredited, there shouldn't be too much of um, restrictions in that. Also allowing credit unions to cash government checks and assignment of salaries and pensions and other superannuation benefits, particularly from government to members of accounts and credit unions. We also talk about the allowance for credit unions, certain qualified credit unions that must satisfy certain, certain um, um, prudential standards to function as national clearing houses. Then we want the establishment of a cooperative bank and the provision of state lands to the development of the headquarters of the league. We have reached a point where we are having a two-year wait for some approval of land for that development, which will give the league the space to engage in, in, in the in-depth developmental activities that it has done. So that is just the, the environment in Trinidad and Tobago at this time, before COVID came in. And then the onset of COVID was in Wuhan, China in December 2019. And as the Triple CU president said, China sneezed and we got the cold down here. The government prohibited entries of persons coming in from China very early in 2020. And then in March 2020, the WHO declared the 
coronavirus, a pandemic, and named it COVID-19. The government took action and introduced regulations through the Ministry of Health in early April, and they classified some businesses as essential and some as non-essential, and they mandated that non-essential businesses should cease operations, and they also mandated strict issues with respect to restrictions to mass gatherings and the whole issue of social distancing. Fortunately, and based on, we believe, on our strong lobbying over the last few years, the credit union sector was declared an essential service sector and thus was required to continue its operation. The government went on and they introduced some economic and social stimulus measures because they felt that while we were having a lot of businesses closing, there was a need to continue with some of the stimulation of economic activity by providing some relief to those persons who would have been effective through their, the loss of em employment and for those businesses that would have been forced to cease operations during the pandemic. And included in that stimulus measure that was announced by the government was a plan to provide a liquidity support program to the credit union movement for affected credit union members to the tune of $100 million. They also talked about assistance to persons who want public assistance and disability grants, and they mandated that the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission should not engage in disconnection for persons who would not have been in a position to pay their light bills. Those regulations and its accompanying restrictions were extended to April 30th, and thereafter it was recently extended by the Prime Minister to May the 15th, with a provision that they would look at the status of the virus at May the 10th and make a determination on how they would move forward with respect to economic activity. As at the date of this webinar, which is today, Trinidad has recorded 116 positive cases of the virus, and they have still recorded eight related virus deaths. And we are happy that there has been strong measures instituted to flatten the curve, and we could say without fear of contradiction, based on the study that was done by the Harvard University recently, that we have been doing a very good job in flattening the curve and dealing with some of the fallout at this time. But we can't be thumping our chest too much at this time because we have some issues we have to deal with. But with respect to the credit union movement, all credit unions have built in their DNA social programs that caters for social outreach to their members in times of need. And in addition to that, the government in itself has a slew of social support services that cater for all citizens, inclusive of credit union members. And based on the fact that we have such a high penetration rate, as I said earlier, 638,000 members, then most of our members are beneficiaries of some of those social benefits. And they include senior citizen pension, public assistance grant, disability grant, school feeding program, disability, disaster relief grant, domestic health grant, education grant, funeral grant, rental assistance, food cards, and in some instances, minor house repairs where a $15,000 grant is given to persons who I need to do, deal with house repairs. And those were things that, that were existing prior to COVID. Since COVID, they have ramped up some of those and they have in, introduced some additional social, supplemental social support services. They have now introduced a salary relief grant of $1,500 per month, which will be applicable in the first instance for three months for all displaced registered workers whose employment would have been affected by the re restrictions of the regulations. And these are for workers who are registered under the NIS system. We have still have any issues with those workers who are not so registered. And then we believe it is a good period of time for the NIB to do some good um, checks to ensure that those persons comply with their requirement, those employers who would not have been paying NIS on behalf of the employees will now comply and do so. They also introduced the immediate distribution of food cards for vulnerable citizens through their members of parliament. We also had food support for families whose children were on school feeding program. And in terms of the some of the existing programs like the public assistance and disability grant, they also had proposed to increase those things as part of their social policy rollout. We are saying that due to the high penetration rate of the credit union movement, quite a number of credit union movement members would have been affected by the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. And as such, we believe they should be accommodated to the government's policy response. 
And we are saying, based on the policy decision, we believe to have credit unions classified as an essential service and that they are remaining open during the period of the restrictions. The credit union is in a very good position to provide those support services and relief to their membership during this period. And we at the League have proposed that the credit unions, based on their deep geographical reach and their convenient locations within the communities, should be used as vehicles for the rollout of some of those government social services. And it's consistent with what Dr. Vincent was talking about. We have been advocating for this for quite a while because we are involved in the government poverty eradication programs. And as such, we believe the credit unions, where they are positioned in their communities, should be used as those avenues. Because we are seeing now a lot of persons who are crying out that the slow pace at which the relief is reaching them. And as such, we believe if there is a partnership with the government and the credit union movement, we believe that could add value to the social and economic welfare and development of those vulnerable citizens. And that will be really be in line with the sustainable development goals, which speaks to no poverty and zero hunger. We believe that inherent in the credit union's DNA are uh, issues, you know, and we heard a big hullabaloo by the banks about the issue of loan waivers and loan deferrals and loan restructuring and all those things. But the credit union was born out of those things. And those things are inherent in the credit union's operation on a day-to-day -day basis. So all it did was to trigger those actions. And let me say, you know, no pun intended, this is not the first pandemic that this movement is facing. We believe that we got through with a pandemic in 2013 when they attempted to bring the credit union bill, which would have been very destructive to the movement. And we were able to stave that off because we had demonstrated there and then that the movement was not just a financial institution, but was a socio-economic institution that provided a particular kind of relief to its membership and had a critical role to play in national development. And that bill was signed, that bill had to be canceled and we are happy to see at this time that we are seeing the light in terms of the legislative agenda. So when the central bank provided the reliefs to the commercial banks, you know, they went ahead and they introduced automatic loan deferrals. But what they have done is to have those things added on, compounded on the member's payments. So while you may be given a relief for three months, the payments would increase. You have to pay out all that interest before you continue your normal payment. Whereas differently in the credit union movement, each credit union deals with the issue based on its own merit and based on the member's circumstance. And as we are saying, we believe that the credit union movement is well positioned to continue to enhance those financial services that it provides. But one of the things that we are guarded against, and some persons say it earlier on, is the issue the potential for delinquent loans. And based on the fact that a lot of our members' employment status have been so affected and the ability to pay on time and the fact that they are now going to have reduced disposable income in their hands, then they may have to jostle to see which payment they can make on a month-to-month -month basis. And as such, there may be instances where delinquency could increase. We are seeing at this time that we have approached our regulator and we continue to approach the regulator to relook the whole issue of IFRS 9 with respect to credit unions and the requirement for loan loss provisioning, particularly in times like these, where that is going to place a heavy burden on credit, the credit union movement. But we believe the real impact of this would not reveal itself until credit unions do the 2020 accounts, and we'll see the real impact of the loan loss provisioning. Several credit unions in Trinidad and Tobago have already completed their financial audits and they would have had scheduled their annual general meetings as is required by the Cooperative Societies Act because they have an obligation to report to the membership. But because the restrictions prevented mass gatherings, all those AGMs would have had to be postponed. And what the movement did, the league, in addition to some of the big credit unions, they approached the regulator in terms of the fact that we were having challenges in one, allocating and declaration of dividends, which would have provided an immediate liquidity support to the membership. The appointment of auditors to the new financial year, the approval of maximum liability for some of the societies, the approval of variation of the quantum of an honorarium paid to the board members, the appointment of auditors to the new term. And in addition to that, 
Most credit union boards could not now meet for board meetings as mandated by the CIA Cooperative Societies Act. And they had to now consider virtual meetings, even though this was not an express provision in most of the bylaws. We, based on the representation that would have been made, the regulator responded. And we are happy to say that there would have been uh, guidance given to credit union movement. And what we are happy about is that the board of directors would have been given the clearance to make budgetary arrangement consistent with the regulation 25.1 in the CSA. The commissioner is now going to consider requests for the interim payment of dividends up to a maximum of 75% of the proposed dividend, which they are saying now can be accommodated from the reserve fund as approved by the commissioner's office. But this has the provision that the audit must have been completed and that the sum must be reimbursed to the fund upon subsequent approval at the AGM when it is held. Credit unions were also advised that they could continue to operate with their current allocation of maximum liability on such time that the AGM is held. They were also advised that with respect to the honorarium, in lieu of paying it, which must be approved at an AGM, the commissioner is prepared to consider approving an interim payment of no more than 50% of the proposed honorarium. But that has to be done with the provision that the audit must be submitted to the commissioner and the annual returns must be submitted. And that it could pay off the reserve fund, but again, it must be reimbursed at the subsequent AGM. They also, yes. advise, they also advise that audits should continue in accordance with Regulation 28, and they advise credit unions that they continue to hold board meetings. They could do it through a virtual process once they yes. have a problem, and it's in cons consistent with Regulations 26. Okay. And we have been doing some of the immediate policy measures. I just want to talk about a major initiative before I close, Colin, and that yes. would have been the $100 million liquidity support program for affected credit union members. We are happy to say that on Monday, April the 27th, we would have signed an agreement, a financing agreement with the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, so that we would be the administrator, the league, and the central finance facility. The league in the most instance would be the facilitator, the administrator of this program, fund on behalf of the government. The government is going to pump that $100 million through the movement to facilitate those affected members who would have lost their jobs or either lost income or for small businesses like soul traders. Remember, we have hairdressers and barbers who are now out of job, who are out of work, and mm -hmm. they are members of the credit union movement. So the league is going to facilitate that program. The program is catering for loans, immediate loans to the members at a much reduced interest rate. It is now at 0.5% of the reducing balance which turns out to be about 3% per annum. And the loan is going to be guaranteed by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The maximum loan amount is going to be $15,000 over a three-month period, but you're not going to get the $15,000 in your hand. The maximum $5,000 per month for three months, May, April, May, and June, or May, March, April, and May, we are going to work this thing out. And the payment is going to commence after the easing up of the regulations by the government. So there's an immediate moratorium on repayment of that loan. Okay. Right? Within the agreement, the government is going to reimburse the credit union within 14 days of the loans being disbursed. So we sign on to that agreement. But we also have a proviso that if the credit unions are not satisfied with the receipt of payment from the government, they could cease being part of that facility. We have taken strong, you know, look at the fact that there is a history of slow payment by government and credit unions will want to ensure that their liquidity situation is not affected in any negative manner, right? The government thereafter set up a 22-member COVID recovery team to, the, to look at the roadmap for economic recovery. We want a direct part of the committee, but we have been consulted by some committee members to provide input into discussion yeah. of the area with respect to the role of small businesses, credit union, and civil society in the economic recovery of Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. We did submit a position paper to the committee, and we are following up on that. And in the position paper, we have made some of the strong demands that Dr. Vince spoke about, that credit unions should now be sitting on the table at yeah. the development of national, social, and economic policies for Trinidad and okay. Tobago. Okay. 
So I, I just want to close by saying that, you know, now more than ever, we have seen that all the cooperative values that we have been called upon to, we were doing all the time, are now being called upon to rescue the world from this pandemic. We believe that the new social order, and I, I don't agree with the issue of the new normal, because yeah. the new normal behavior will fall into bad habit once again. Yes. I think we should have a new social order, and it's supposed to be characterized by the values of the movement, which talks about self-responsibility, equity, solidarity, social responsibility, caring for others and the community, and cooperation among cooperatives. Yes. 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 And while some are advocating for a new normal post-COVID, we like, like to advocate for a new social order where humane economic and social development, when mm -hmm. super greedy economic development and the values of the cooperative business model would be the guiding characteristic of yes. the new social order. Yes. We like to advocate for speedy or immediate enactment of legislation to bring into effect the cooperative authority. And we'll also see the immediate reengineering of the Commissioner of the Office yes. of Commissioner for Cooperative Development to show that all the financial and regulatory issues can be addressed with alacrity and credit unions will be more at the center for economic development. Fantastic, man. Colin and the team for this opportunity. And I hope yes. that God continue to bless us and to guide our Caribbean people through this pandemic. Yes. Much. This is the Trinidad and Tobago League response at this time. Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for, for that holistic um, position in terms of the, the Trinidad and Tobago experience. And I know we we are beyond one two three, but I just want to give participants, you know, the opportunity to hear the responses which were posed. And even as as um Joe, you made the point in terms of the IFRS 9 um, position and in terms of lobbying for that, I have a question for Winston in terms of that that collective lobbying and that regional lobbying because IFRS 9 being an international reporting standard, is there any any position or, or plan on the part of the triple CU to, to lobby, particularly post-COVID, where credit unions may, may encounter a, a growth in delinquency? Is there any part, you know, plans on the part of triple CU as far as lobbying for those kinds of um of reliefs on relief when it comes to addressing credit unions? I asked Winston just to touch on that. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Yeah. Moderator. But uh, this is something that has occupied the, 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 the thoughts of our <coughs> directors at Triple C U. Even from the onset of the IFRS 9, we, we thought a more <coughs> collaborative regional approach to implementing IFRS 9 <coughs> would have been the preferred position. And even though it didn't actually go as we hoped for and even thought we, we would have been able to guide. Nonetheless, <clears throat> we have been in discussion, sir, um, certainly. We, we have been taking guidance from the World Council, which has a okay. extensive body of knowledge that has been built up as to how we treat with, with um, the IFRS 9 situation. And so we are willing to, and we have been engaging, where we think that there's need for discretion to be applied. We are yes. willing, and we have made some, you know, um, initial um, <clears throat> attempts at engaging regional regulator authorities okay. to look at, at the whole um, implementation and the whole matter of compliance with IFRS 9. It is an okay. approach that we believe that we should remain steadfast. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Winston. And we have a question for Dr. Henry as far as the, the capacity and the positioning of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. And the question is whether the college would be willing to lend research capacity to both the local and the regional um, credit union movements as far as building that capacity, which each of the presenters touched on. So in terms of building that research capacity in particular, um, how, how strategically positioned is the college at this time ready to offer that support, Dr. Henry? I want to start by saying I am very happy that the former chairman is pleased with some of the things that we're doing. 
<laughs> um, and I think it was Winston who said COVID, uh, or I think it was Winston who said COVID is a pandemic that shouldn't be allowed to go to waste. Yes. Um, sometimes it takes a crisis for us to know what we are capable of. And we have always had a view that Cipriani, Cipriani College is regional community property. So we're hoping that um, we, what we've done in terms of, of our strategic direction is that we've used this situation to completely reorient ourselves. And Colin, who is the head of the cooperative studies department might be better um, qualified to address this than I am. But all I would tell you is that as far as I am concerned, the college is regional public property. And um, my personal passion for my, my personal passion for the people sector and for empowering and protecting vulnerable people, I think this is a, a, a particular opportunity for us to, to do that in in partnership. So what we're doing now is only the start, and I think Colin between himself and Sheldon, and I just invite Colin to, to speak to those now. Oh, all right, Dr. Henry, you, you just, um, I didn't, right before you invited me to speak, um, just, just emphasize which point you wanted to touch on. Well, what I wanted you to do is to just, excuse me, to speak briefly on the vision that you've shared yeah. with me that I've brought into you and yes. Sheldon on yes. where we're going to take the college as far as both teaching as well as research and development in the, um, yes. for, for the credit, for, for the cooperative sector. Yes, definitely. And when we speak to cooperative development, um, definitely it is far reaching and all encompassing as far as 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 far as we look at it and um most recently at the end of last year we we instituted an initiative for the local credit union sector where we offered scholarships to each credit union to send one representative into our certificate and credit union management program so and you know this is keeping with any philosophical underpinnings as far as you know looking at education, training, information, and really bringing people within the arm, within the fold of the cooperative credit union movement by giving them both the, the practical as well as the theoretical and philosophical um, exposure and, and at the college. I know that is something we are deeply committed to. And even as far as extending the program into the entrepreneurial arm and getting persons involved in entrepreneurship as a lot of our credit union members are involved in entrepreneurship bringing them into the fold and really looking at harnessing that and creating an ecosystem that it could grow flourish and as well as give back to the cooperative credit union movement and as i'm on that point you know i i, I direct a question to Halle, and the question from it from the the all the registrants is that, and the participants is, what do you see the role, is the role for credit unions in working with other types of cooperatives to facilitate entrepreneurial development? The question is along the lines of entrepreneurial development, credit unions contributing to that, specifically with other types of cooperatives, the non-financial, and of course, other SMEs. Thank you, and Colin. Yes. Now, I, I, we believe that this is a very important role that credit union, the financial sector, has to play with the non-financial sector. Historically, what's happened in the financial sector is that the financial sector has grown from the significantly, and we have left our brothers and sisters along the road. And even at the regional level, I know we have discussions at the regional level that we have to look at how can we assist the non-financial cooperatives. Because really and truly, the non-financial cooperatives are the production arms 
and what there must be a marriage between the financial arms and the productive arms. Because no more than ever, small and medium-sized businesses will require the type of support and interventions to allow them to grow if you're going to build out the economy. Tourism is going to take some time to come back. So the, yeah. the renewable energy, um, um, capacity for, in relation to food security, building up those capacities, and there's an important role that credit unions have to play to ensure that we give the type of capacity to those yeah. merchant businesses and give them the technical support. A lot of the challenges that they have not been provided with the technical support to allow them. They're, they're a good business, they're in a business, whether it's an efficient cooperative, whether it's a productive cooperative, but they need the technical support along with the financial support. So yeah. part of our history or our ethos can be, look, let's marry what we've learned technically in relation to the management of businesses. And there has to be a new approach, a new paradigm as it relates to financing small and medium-sized businesses. So there has to be a new approach. And we have to be using the FinTech um, um, arrangements so that the court not vendor who is on, uh, who is in Trinidad and Tobago. Romney Savannah, <laughs> yes. But on his on his cell phone. So that's what we're talking about, moving the yes. FinTech yes. to support local industries. Yeah. And that is uh, that is uh, something that we are passionate about in my business. And we are going to ensure that we provide the type of um, infrastructure and resources to facilitate um, those micro and small businesses. Fantastic. Great, man. Thank you, Ali. And it's so instructive that you speak to that because it kind of dovetails into the next question, which, uh, which I would be asking to Lambert. And as Ali, as you made the point, you know, um, the World Council of Credit Union just last week launched their whole digital transformation lab, really to, to facilitate digitization um, within credit unions in, in different sectors. And as far as that goes and that whole experience, I, I just want to bring in Lambert and, and ask him, as far as, especially with his experience as an attorney at law, the question is in terms of legislation. We are now in COVID and post-COVID, and a number of the speakers, including Mr. Remy Lassie, touched on changes that will be required to legislation to move the credit, the cooperative credit union movements forward. Now, um, Lambert, in terms of those areas for for moving organizations forward, as well as if there have been any moves within the region to, to provide that regulatory framework and legislative framework to buffer credit unions as, in, as um, tools and vehicles of social protection as far as moving them forward. How is the, the legislation looking? What is required? What have you seen? Lambert, you there with us? Well, that being the case, I, I could even ask, well, Mr. Winston, Winston, if you're there with us, you know, as far as the, the legislative, in terms of the legislative arm and what, what will be required and what you have seen, you know, on the part of Triple C U in the different regions. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for that intervention. I, I I can't speak to a specific legislation at the yeah. moment. But what I can say for the last few years, WACU, as the World Council, has been pushing this whole matter of digitalization of yeah. the whole movement. And I think it is creating a wave across the movement, and we in the regional spirit we have seen the need for us to go more and more digital it, it is yeah. something that is is really forced upon us it is not something that it's a choice is the way business is being conducted and without being specific i am seeing the need for more regulatory changes for example we spoke earlier on through the <clears throat> session about the need to have as a result of necessity coming out of covid to mm -hmm. have more online interventions by way of our meetings and so forth. Board meetings are now being conducted regularly. Yeah. We know get this enforcing law um, by way of the regulator changes, but I want to go also further because of the way the economies are shifting in the region and globally, really. 
Yeah. Interest rates, for example, we have been in a low interest rate regime for the last several years. Yeah. And from my point of view, I don't see us reverting from that. Hmm. It says to me that we'll have to look at the way our rules are written and to be able to give credit to them a broad yeah. space to operate within. And with that, I mean, we talk about creating a new entrepreneurial class. Mm. So, Correct. inculcating, developing a culture of small businesses. This yeah. is where credit unions will have to go in order to remain viable. Credit unions cannot make, um, make themselves viable by just operating on interest rates from loans anymore. So, all of these things will require legislative changes. Back home in Jamaica, I can tell you, we have actually appointed an attorney, um, a former leader of the movement, to start looking at our rules in a very comprehensive way to see how we have to change the rules. Mm -hmm. the new dynamic that lies ahead. So yes, we have a great need, and I would say an urgent need, yes. for legislative change to guide us in the future. Yes, excellent. Thank you. And the next question we have is from Mr. Remy. And in, in terms of your presentation, Mr. Remy, and some some cooperators asking the question in a post COVID environment, how do we see the relationship between cooperative credit unions and the non financial cooperatives changing and even improving? How, how do we see, and based on what you have presented and the positions that have been put in place, particularly as you speak to a new social order, how do you see that, you know, that relationship changing? And now, this experience facilitating something like that. Thanks, Colin. And, and I, I am very optimistic that we are going to have a very dynamic relationship going forward because we have recognized that the league, and we are thankful for the work that was done by the operations, where we have had some of those non-financial cooperatives as part of our shared services program. Yeah. And, and we believe now is the opportune time to deepen that, to widen the, the catchment with those non financial cooperatives. I can yeah. recall when we were discussing the cooperative policy. That is why we were adamant that we should not just have a policy for credit, uh, credit unions. It should be a cooperative policy because we believe that there should be a strong relationship between the financial and the non-financial cooperatives in terms of how we work towards building that whole economic body. I am seeing more than ever now, particularly with respect to the area of agriculture. We have to re-energize those agricultural cooperatives because we are talking about food security post-COVID. Um, we are now realizing how important it is. How do we encourage farmers to form themselves into cooperatives so that they could maximize and work on economies of scale and allow themselves to benefit from lower prices in terms of equipment and machinery and the cost of labor and those kind of things. In addition to that, the movement have been advocating, and I'm saying this with a little trade unionism in the back of me, that we have advocated long time for the yeah. CP and the URP programs to be transformed into community cooperatives and yes. allow those persons who work there to become owners of their own destiny. And that whole entrepreneurial developmental trust we're talking about, that could be encouraged. And the funding for that could come from the financial cooperatives because they are in a much better liquid position. And those yes. are the kind of initiatives the league would want to work on going forward. And we would, we would push in that colony with a lot of us in the near future because we believe yes. more, more than ever. We yes. are free that space and we must now walk into that space, demand our respect, and make the necessary yes. interventions. That Fantastic. Is Fantastic. And I, I like the, the spirit of cooperation. And even as this meeting is a partnership between the college, the Triple C U. And the League of Trinidad and Tobago, I like that intervention in terms of that partnership and making those in, those kinds of intentional interventions. And I think the, the movement is big enough, it's strong enough. And even now, in our era of social distancing and physical distancing, we're strong enough to, to make those interventions. And I have a question that I would like to throw out to the panel. And anyone can pick up, and, and a number of you can pick up. And, it is along the lines of government considering the payment of cash and bonds to meet wages of the public officers. Right? So credit unions are, are asked to consider, or being asked to consider 
accepting these bonds and provide cash in exchange um, for, for these bonds, you know, or utilize the bonds as some form of collateral. Um, now that this has been trust in the way of the cooperative credit union movement, how do you think that will really facilitate uh, both the growth of the organization and the strengthening of the member's position in a sustainable way? Okay, let me just take a first stab at that, and I know yeah. um, Holly and Winston will also <laughs> yeah. because it's a very interesting position. And you know, the whole issue of bonds as payment in lieu of salary and all the different things was an issue that was very ripe in Trinidad and Tobago some years yeah. ago. Yes. And, and again, we we are saying that, that that has to be the subject of some more in-depth discussions because we have to be clear in terms of when that is done. You know, the actual fact that it could be redeemed, that it could add monetary value down the road, and we could have that generation well being built for the movement. Now, yeah. it, it has positives and it has negatives in terms of the approach. And I think it's something that has to be examined. Each territory has different regulations. Unfortunately, the region still has the issue of, you know, inconsistent legislations where it comes to the regulation of credit unions and cooperatives. But I think you have to examine it for what it is worth. We can't just dismiss the idea up front. The concern yeah. we would have is that how would it affect the liquidity requirements of credit unions yes. with respect to the rigid standards that are imposed? And then our regulators will have to get involved in yes. terms of relaxing some of the standards with respect to liquidity requirement and the ratios to ensure yeah. that how do you qualify those bonds in terms of your financial statements? Yeah. You know, who's going to so there are a lot of things that have to be considered in terms of going that direction. But it's something I think that we could discuss, look at the feasibility of it before you could implement it. I don't think we should just rush into it based yeah. on where we are, because there are yeah. implications for both the movement and for the individuals at the end of the day. Yes, great. Thank you. I know, Ali. You change the community. Let me see if I have a mark. Yes. Yeah, we it, yeah. It, it has been a, it has is an interesting concept of the cash and bonds. But I think in the, every territory, as Brother Remy indicated, we have to look at it. Um, there is there may some merit in it. We, we are operating in a very low interest regime as it stands now. So interest on we're not going to make you're not making any money. There's no return on interest at all. So we have money in the banks and there's no return. So we yeah. have to look from that point of view that if yeah. we have a bond that can support that we can get some interest return for the credit union and then we, so we have to look at it from that point of view one the other point of view is uh we have to look at the liquidity ratios um in the, in the respective credit unions because it has to do with liquidity but i think we have to have a discussion around it it's not going to go away i think and a more and as the covid as, as we do the research and the the impact of COVID-19 on the region, yeah. you'll find that governments are going to be hand strong because if you don't have revenues, government create, gets money from taxation. And if people are not unemployed, there's no money coming in. If yeah. they're not tourists, there's no foreign exchange coming in. And so, it, it, so it's something we have to look at, have a mature discussion about. I'm not going to throw it through the window, uh, but I think something we need to have a, a mature discussion on it. Because yes. there's there's some pros and there's some cons. Some cons I think yes. We need to have um, mature discussion. I, I heard it was in, it's in Lucia, I think. Um, it was um, piloted in solution already. I'm told, um, but I think that we have to have a discussion around it. Uh, I'm not going to trip through the window um, because these are different times. These are difficult times, and it's, we have to look at the best mechanisms and modalities to yes. ensure the sustainability. Definitely of the credit union sector, but more important, the lives and the livelihood of our members. Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, Winston, I, I don't know if you want to chime in and, chime in and just offer your <laughs> thoughts on it in terms of the bonds. <laughs> uh, it could easily uh, be answered by saying ditto to what my colleagues have said. Uh, yeah. I think anything that will have driven this initiative, though, has to suggest that there has to be some concern with liquidity. And um, it's not something that you need to dismiss. 
I think it, it, it is a worthwhile um, initiative to be pursued, but of course, a lot of details are required. Yeah. I think it is probably a play on the cooperative principle. It's a, it's a social partnership in the formation, the were you to go that route. And I think there can be merit to it, but as my colleague said, there have to be a lot of details to, to coming to a conclusion. Yeah. I think something like this may have been um, done, I am trying to recall, sometime back in Jamaica, we are thinking a public sector, um, uh, the public sector may, may have been issued some bonds in lieu of immediate payment as a okay. result of um, 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 bargaining by the unions. But I can tell you, I, it wasn't a very popular thing. Okay. Because people are looking forward to having cash to dispose of as they see fit. But I would not rule it out as a cooperative movement. I think we need to embrace new initiatives that may bring yes. on board social partners. And I Definitely. think that it is part of our remit to engage government in different forms to see how we can work with government to really make products and services more available to our members. And so with that said, I would want to hear more. You know, Fantastic. This particular Excellent. Initiative. Excellent. Yes. So at this point in time, I, I really want to thank you all for your comments. And I want to offer all, all our presenters here the opportunity just uh, to give a closing comments within a minute. And uh, I think we have, you know, really created a good foundation to segue into the next webinar next week, Thursday, at the same time, you know, where we look at the more operational issues. So, Winston, I, I, I'm taking the, the order of um, presentation. So, just in a minute, you could you could um, deliver your thoughts, your closing thoughts on this. Yes, sir. All right. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you once again, and um, and thanks to the listening audience for what I consider a very um, fruitful um, exchange. I see that the role of the triple CU has been pretty much um, crystallized in terms of a way forward. Uh, someone used the term, it's now business unusual rather than business as usual. Mm. I think we have to play a more pioneering, a more, <clears throat> um, you know, creating new frontiers of opportunities for our membership. We have to create that new vision. And I speak of, and I've spoken elsewhere about this new entrepreneurial class. I think it is within us to steer that movement and to bring about this change as an integral part of the movement. I am seeing a need for a greater relationship. And I'll be speaking to your colleague outside of this. Nice. So the colleagues want to pursue to the working together. I mean, our objectives are similar. And I think collectively, we can be a more empowering um, organization, both individually and, and, as, an, and, and as, a, as a collective going forward. And so I look forward to the future with great optimism. And I want to thank everyone again and look forward to further engagement. Yes, Dr. Henry. Thanks, congratulations to you and Sheldon. And I want to express my thanks to the separate uh, to the Caribbean Confederation as well as to our own um, <clears throat> our, our, our own uh, federation in Trinidad and Tobago this is this has been a pleasure to contribute but it's also been very enlightening I think we have been able to distill a number of lessons and certainly from the perspective of the college I just want to commit ourselves to working in partnership um, with with all the fellow cooperators. Thank you again, uh, Colin and, and Sheldon, and our presenters. Great. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Halley. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, let me, first of all, again, express thanks and appreciation for participating in such important um, uh, discussions. I, I am very optimistic about the future of the credit union movement. I think as we um, fight this pandemic, it is clear that credit unions must be at the seat and the center of development in the Caribbean, at the national level and at the regional level. I know we have been having discussions 
um, the Barbados movement be sitting now on the social partnership after years of lobbying. And I would like to see that replicated across each of the jurisdictions and at the level of the CARICOM that the CCCU has its rightful place. The region it will be richer because we have participated. Yes. I am optimistic that given the opportunities for leveling the playing field, that the credit union and the cooperative business model will be sustainable and make a difference in the lives and the livelihood of our Barbadian people and fantastic. the Caribbean people. Thank you. Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ali. And the last minute closing comments to, to you, Mr. Remy. Okay, Colin, once again, let me really congratulate you and Sheldon. And it really is a, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of pride knowing that, you know, <laughs> Cipriani is finally doing what I believe Cipriani can do. I, I have a passion for the work of Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. I am convinced that Cipriani could be a regional integration um, catalyst. And I think by using labor and cooperative studies and the rolling out of those educational programs, Cipriani could now position itself. We had attempted to do it in the past. Cipriani was at some CHPCU conventions about three or four years ago. We had a little falling back. I think now is the opportunity for Cipriani to take the lead. And we had, I think you have taken the lead in this um, particular initiative. I would want it to continue. Rest assured, the league is going to be pushing you guys because we would want to make some, um, put some meat into our relationship that we have our memorandum of understanding we we'll want to ensure that it works to the and redound to the benefit of the movement and i am looking forward we were demanded in Trinidad and tobago for the movement to have its respect and as ali said to be sitting at the rightful place in terms of policy development for the economic and social development of Trinidad and tobago and by extension the wider caribbean region this was a fantastic opportunity and i really hope that you will continue and that we will see more benefits coming out of occasions like this. Thanks much, and I really enjoyed the, the interaction. Thank you so much, all the presenters. And the discussion will continue next week, Thursday, 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., and we will get even more granular. I think this was an excellent catalyst to begin that discussion. And next week, Thursday, we'll be continuing the webinar series credit unions and COVID-19. We thank you for all our viewers, all the participants. We thank you for the questions and all have been noted and it will be continued to be shared through the various platforms. I think Mr. Remy, he indicated more than just moral suasion. It appeared to be a, a violent shove in the direction of, our, <laughs> of, of cooperation and really you know, regional integration, you know? And yes, we really want to thank the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions for really jumping on board quickly, effortlessly, seamlessly. And we look forward to your continued support as we move forward with this webinar series, Credit Unions and COVID-19. The response of our movement, our beloved movement. So thank you for all our listeners, all our presenters and all our participants in this webinar. See you next week for the second webinar. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Goodbye. <laughs>